welcome to Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about the people behind today's virology headlines, people working to understand viruses and how they affect you. We are talking with students, postdocs, and other virologists so that you can learn who they are and what they do. I am Larissa Thackeray, and I am hosting this podcast from America's heartland in St. Louis, Missouri. On June 2nd, 2022, we talked with Sri Ram Kumar, graduate student at the Institute of Virology, University of Munster, Germany. He completed his bachelor's and master's of technology from Anna University in Chennai, India. He uses infection of 3D lung models to study innate immunity against highly pathogenic influenza A viruses and SARS-CoV-2. So thanks uh, for talking with us today. Um, Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Sri Ram Kumar, and I was basically born and brought up in Chennai, which is a metropolitan city in South India. And I was born in a family that had very little to do with the logical sciences, I would say. So my um, dad was in the marketing sector, and my mom was a school teacher who's teaching social sciences and mathematics. And I also have a sister who is now dealing with commercial accounting and banking sector. So I was basically put up in a family that had very little to do with biology, like the immediate family itself. Nevertheless, I think I had this inclination for biology and its strong influence coming from my uh, extended family members because my grandfather was already a scientist. So he was already um, in uh, the field of taxonomy. So he was doing classification of nematodes in the previous century. So I also have an aunt who is uh, so, uh, who was um, a high school biology teacher. So I was always told that I was carrying this gene for biology um, in my, like through my family. But I think it was definitely uh, during my sixth grade when I had this real cut or uh, like when I had this real inclination for biology when it was introduced to me in my schooling. Um, while the uh, school educational curriculum itself introduced me that the cell is the basic structural and functional unit of life. So that was the biology that I had, but I um, fortunately had a cousin sister who was pursuing her um, undergraduate in bi- bi- biotechnology. And through her studies, we always had interactions and I was dealing with a much higher level of biology. So I remember having uh, conversations with her about what a DNA is and how it replicates and uh, how, what's an electron transport chain as early as in my sixth grade. And this, I think already, Um, instilled that very strong um, interest for biology in me. And also I had, I think, really amazing uh, biology teachers all through my schooling. So I think all these came together to uh, sort of give me the reason that, okay, so it's biology that I would be specializing on uh, uh, for the rest of my life. But I think the real, let's say the breakthrough in my um, academic decision-making happened when I was in my 11th grade, because I think I had the opportunity to um, carry out real research um, at an Indian um, institution, which is the Indian Institute of Technology, one of the top Indian institutes. And there was this program called the Research Science Initiative, which was actually uh, initiated by the Center for Excellence in Education in Virginia, but we had the Indian version of it. So I was one of the um, uh, students that was selected uh, from among the schools. And I remember uh, carrying out a project on microbiology. So basically, I was working with a research scientist where, uh, and uh, through this uh, experience, I isolated microbes from soil, microbes from wa- like water and curd and different food products. And this was already amazing because we were all, always told about microbes and microbial infections all through our lives. But to actually work with them was like a real reason for me to um, choose research because all along I knew that biology was my fault, but I always had this confusion as to whether I had to pursue research or should I practice medicine. So I think this experience was really um, a decision maker for me that, okay, I am cut out for research and this is what I have to pursue. So I ended up choosing um, biotechnology for my undergrad and then pursued postgrad. And it was very clear that, okay, so I would get into like scientific research and this is the part for me. And that, that's what really happened. Great. And can you tell us a little bit about sort of your path in undergrad to where you are now? Like, how did you arrive or decide on the various institutions that you went to? And like, how did you uh, pick your particular labs or your particular focus? How did that all happen? Yeah. So um, as I already mentioned, I already, yeah, so the decision of pursuing um, an undergrad in biotechnology was very thought, like, well thought of. 
Uh, and I always was fascinated about the immune system because uh, even during my school, when I uh, was taught about the different systems of the human body, what really intrigued me was the immune system because you have these different plethora of cells, which all arise from uh, like a subset of progenitor cells. So I was really fascinated how this all happens and how one particular cell type can give rise to different cells of the body, like the important cells of the body. And um, so I really wanted to specialize in immunology in the first place. But what really happened is I um, decided to pursue uh, a biotechnology course, which was more inclined towards engineering than the basic sciences. So even during my first year of my undergraduate, I was already involved in uh, like research projects, but these were more related to, related to chemical engineering and stuff like that. But I always had this thing that, okay, it has to be something to do with real life sciences or medical sciences. So I was always waiting for the right um, opportunity. And this happened in my third year of undergraduate when I received um, a research fellowship from the Indian Academy of Sciences. Uh, I basically had a, a specific research allowance and uh, the travel support from the Indian government uh, that supported me to pursue any research project that I wanted to like, carry out or like to answer a specific questions that I always wanted to in any other institute of my choice. And I had the fortunate opportunity to work with this amazing virologist uh, named Dr. Soma Chakopadhyay at the Institute of Life Sciences. And she was back then working on chikungunya viruses, dengue viruses, and Japanese encephalitis. And I had the opportunity to work with one of her PhD students. So my project was uh, trying to understand the protein-protein interaction between NSP1 and NSP2 of chikri and how this interaction favors the virus replication. I mean, again, all along, I was always told and I heard about viruses and virus infections, but this was the very first time I saw viruses under a confocal microscope, and this was already super fascinating. And this was actually, fortunately or unfortunately, a mismatch because I proposed a project on more of immunology in the context of virus infections, but this was on hardcore molecular virology. So I did not know if I was, I had the real uh, let's say the interest uh, to um, follow up on it, but I would say, uh, like thinking about it now, that it was just the right choice for me. And yeah, so the whole project was mostly about cloning the different proteins and doing Western blots and microscopy and stuff like that. But what really was a turning point for me from this experience is the interaction that I had with my mentor because she also really said why it is important that. I have to stay in virology or people, we need more virologists because at least in a country like India, back then there were very limited virologists. And she said that man can make so much of advancements and developments in the field of technology, but we will always have to deal with viruses, which are always emerging and re-emerging. And there's always a constant need for better diagnostics and therapeutics and there's an urgent need that there are more people in this context. And that kind of gave me, gave me this impression that, okay, maybe this field needs attention. And it, it's also not boring. It's really interesting because I was always uh, really um, taken away by all the experiments and results that I got during these two months. And it was not just about research. I think she also like had this, uh, um, let's say this image to see her students succeed. So it was also a vision for her mentorship that, really gave me this decision that, okay, so if I choose academic research as my career, I actually have uh, like really important reasons that would give me like sort of a return to stay in this field. So that was the decision. And uh, even during these two months, I already uh, made up my mind that, okay, so it's going to be virology that I would be uh, focusing on for the rest of my life. And I fortunately had another fellowship during the same period, which I was not able to pursue, which was also on virology. So I kind of uh, thought that maybe I have to redirect it and make use of it for my bachelor's thesis, which is what I did. So um, my experience with Dr. Chattopadhyay was actually the decision maker for me to pursue a virology project for my bachelor's thesis also. So for my thesis, I worked with Dr. Uh, Krishnan from the Center for Cellular and Molecular uh, Biology, again, one of the top Indian institutes in India. And there, I had a different perspective of virology. So with SOMA, I worked with a virus that causes virus infection, but with Krishnan, uh, Dr. Krishnan, I worked with an oncogenic virus. So I basically worked with um, hepatitis C. And my project was again more towards molecular virology because I was looking into Yamanaka factors, which were um, actually um, involved in reprogramming the cells from an epithelial state to a mesenchymal state, uh, a phenomenon that is classic for many of the oncogenic viruses. 
So I, so I was again um, involved in cloning and best plotting of all these genes and trying to understand what exact molecular roles and modulation of signaling pathways that these proteins have to do during this um, cellular phenomenon. And I was, of course, I mean, this experience again uh, reinforced uh, my like love of virology, but also gave a very different perspective about viruses because of course, yes, people knew viruses and people independently talk about cancer and how deleterious it is, but I mean, at least at that point of time, it was not much discussed as to viruses also had a significant role to play in specific cancers. And this gave me a very different perspective about virology as such. What was also um, at that point um, very interesting is I happened to win one of um, a science communication competitions at national level, and like, which was conducted by NovaScience, which is a Denmark company. And because of this, I was offered a six month internship in their uh, R&D facility. And Novozymes, they deal with uh, making different mutants of enzymes for different purposes, uh, for R&D purposes. So it was nothing to do with virology, but I was also like of the opinion that, okay, so all along you've been trying your hand only with different virology projects. Maybe you have to give yourself a chance to try something else. So I actually accepted this offer after my bachelor's. And so basically I took a one year of academic break and then uh, um, took up this internship opportunity at the R&D facility. And I would say this gave a very different uh, experience in terms of techniques and in terms of methods, because I was working with high throughput screening um, and all these bio robots um, in terms of the technological aspects. But again, this was uh, not anything to do with um, virology or medicine as such. So I do acknowledge the fact that this experience was interesting and it built me in a different way, but somehow I still had this thing that I was not contributing really anything to medicine or to, me to the medical field or to the public health and these concepts. So I somehow decided to come back into academic research and get into virology again. And I again happened to um, have an internship opportunity with Dr. Luke Elizabeth Hanna, who, who, who is now the WHO liaison for tuberculosis and HIV in India. So Dr. Hanna worked with the intersection of tuberculosis and HIV. And I happened to work on a, a clinical virology project where I was evaluating two candidate HIV vaccines. So this was more of um, clinical level of virology or vaccine trials. So I, I basically had to do uh, like a lot of flow cytometry work with TBMCs from patients at different time points and see if this prophylactic uh, vac vaccines are really like um, incurring any, any protective effect against HIV. So this was very interesting. Uh, I was also working on a side project uh, with um, uh, mucosal immunity. So with regards to HIV mucosal immunity, where, uh, where I had to work with um, sexual workers in India and then collect mucosal sa samples from um, uh, the uh, cervix and then um, assign or uh, like evaluate the different cells that are really involved in conferring mucosal immunity. And this again was a very different perspective of virology that I had because at least the previous two other projects that I had gave me an impression of it's mostly cellular and molecular virology. But this was the first experience that I had at clinical level. And it sort of gave me this impression that, okay, it's not only important to carry out research like on bench, but we always have this concept of bench to bedside and also bench, or let's say bedside back to bench. So this somehow created this impression that research, especially in the medical sciences, is always an iteration. You always have something in the lab going to the clinic and something from the clinic coming back to the lab. And this was interesting. And this was the time I decided that, okay, maybe um, this is the right time that I have to pursue a PhD. So, because I had very good academic records and I also had publications from all the other previous internships that I performed. So I applied to a lot of US universities, but that was the time I got rejected and came to the realization that, okay, maybe I should not undermine um, the experience that I would gain from masters. So I decided to pursue masters in the same university where I pursued my bachelor's also. And it was also in uh, uh, biotechnology, but I was very specific that I have to somehow fine tune every research experience that I would have in my master's towards biology. So I can like put all of my experiences in a string and then get into my PhD. Uh, but I was also very uh, mindful that these experiences that I should have in my master's should somehow prepare me in a different way, either in terms of techniques or in terms of concepts. So I once again received another research fellowship from um, uh, the Indian government. Um, and I happened to work at the Indian Institute of Integrative Medicine. And so that the, the lab itself was working on cancer and cancer therapeutics, but 
Um, there was also a need for them to develop 3D models because there was this issue about cancer therapeutics not penetrating to the core of the tumor. So it was important that they had to develop these 3D uh, tumor models so that they could evaluate the, the therapeutics. So I was of the opinion, maybe it is not directly related to virology, but it definitely could be applied to problems in virology also. So I did uh, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity of working on this project and it was actually super cool because I worked with primary pancreatic cells and created these three-dimensional spheroids and of course applied them to evaluate their own cancer therapeutics. But I really appreciated the fact that I had this opportunity to learn how to establish a whole new experimental model because I think, especially in this decade, we are getting into the importance of why these 3D models are important and how they could solve problems that uh, are posed by, or let's say the gaps that are left by the in vitro and the other in vivo models. So this was another really um, important stint in my career. And finally, I also uh, realized the fact that all of my experiences were only at national level. And maybe if I'm targeting, targeting at international institutes for my PhD, maybe an international research experience would also help me to get there. So I was actually applying to a lot of um, uh, labs outside of India for my master's thesis when I actually got um, again, a research internship from the Nanyang Technological University, which is, which is in Singapore. And I had the opportunity to work with Professor uh, Richard Sugru, who is actually well known in the field of respiratory syncytial viruses. And he was also um, working on um, his introductory project on influenza viruses. Um, and I was actually working with him on that. So the project was actually to understand uh, what kind of restriction factors do humans have that would help them uh, to restrict infection with highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses, uh, because there's this striking difference in the way um, seasonal influenza viruses and highly pathogenic influenza viruses uh, deal with the human system and how the human systems deal with these viruses in return. So uh, this project was in terms of, uh, like it was again related to molecular virology. Uh, so I had to do a lot of Western blotting and cloning and transocal microscopy. But this of course gave me a very different reason uh, that it is important to work with viruses which are of pandemic potential and the fact that I was able to work with influenza was very fascinating because it's a very minimalistic virus with very minimalistic genome but it has been existing for so many centuries and I got to the realization that the classification system is just exploding every year because of the quick evolution that, the, that these influenza viruses pose. So I was really taken away with these viruses. And at the end of it, um, I already made up my mind that, okay, so it is going to be influenza viruses that I have to work on for my PhD. So I was very stubborn or perseverant, whatever the case may be, that um, I applied specifically to influenza virus projects in different, different countries. And that's how I came here for my PhD. So right now I'm working at the Institute of Virology um, at the University of Munster in the research group of Professor Stefan Ludwig and Dr. Linda Brunetta. And I'm working with uh, more of an intersection of fundamental research and therapeutic research, and also at the intersection of virology and immunology, because my project is uh, dealing with uh, evaluating the therapeutic potential of interference for um, respiratory viruses. So that's my whole research trajectory in detail. Wow, that's like a lifetime of research just to get to your PhD. <laughs> that's impressive. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your lab? So is it a big lab? You know, uh, what's sort of the mix of people that are in your lab? And then maybe talk a little bit about sort of what is your thesis project? You know, what is sort of like the big picture? And then what are some of the techniques that you use to do your research? Sure, yes. So um, to comment ab about the lab itself, we are one group in the whole institute. So we are uh, a total of 40 people. Uh, so it's definitely a huge lab, which has a lot of postdocs and a, a lot more of PhDs and a little um, proportion of master students. So the um, institute itself is headed by Professor Ludwig, but uh, they also, I mean, we also have different subgroups, each of which is focusing on its own research topic. So we have a group that's focusing on um, immune metabolism in the context of virus infection, another group that's, work is, uh, that's focusing more on the protein, uh, uh, or let's say the host virus um, uh, interaction. And then I'm in a group that's focusing more on the immune, innate immunity aspects. And there's also another group which is working on the oncolytic potential of uh, influenza viruses to be used for oncolytic therapy. 
So we, in, uh, the Institute as such was focusing more on influenza viruses for more than a couple of decades. And right now, because of the pandemic, we also get into uh, SARS-CoV-2 because of the case that influenza and SARS-CoV-2 have a lot more in common, but also a lot more different. Um, so to talk about my project, um, as I already mentioned, I'm working on evaluating the therapeutic potential of human interferon alpha subtypes um, uh, for treatment against uh, influenza viruses, both seasonal and highly pathogenic uh, influenza viruses, and now because of the pandemic uh, against SARS-CoV-2. So um, if we take the uh, human interferon system, basically interferons are um, signaling proteins which are produced in response to any virus infection. And these bind to the interferon alpha receptors, activate the JAK-STAT signaling cascade, which then uh, uh, get into the nucleus and then um, activate the several different interferon stimulator genes, which are antiviral and immunomodulatory in function, which then uh, impede the virus at several different levels. So uh, this actually made me realize how human and human cells have already evolved with such a sophisticated and diverse mechanism to um, you know, restrict virus infection. But it also makes us think if the human cells are already equipped with such a sophisticated system, why do we get infected in the first place? So that sort of made me realize that there's always this requiem hypothesis that's interplaying. I mean, humans have something, but the viruses are also smart in antagonizing these immune responses. So which exactly gave rise to uh, what's called the interferon therapy. So we basically give interferons exogenously and kind of reactivate the jack cell pathway and you know, reestablish this whole ISG program and still establish um, a successful restriction of infection. But what's so interesting is uh, if we take the in human interferon system, it's so diverse. So we have three different interferon types, like classified based on the uh, receptor um, types uh, in humans. And um, there was also a recent discovery that there's a type four human interference system. And what's also intriguing about this is the type one interference, which has sub um, types of the whole family. So we have the alphas, the betas, and the other non-canonical interferon uh, sub, uh, type one interference subtypes. Interestingly, interferon alpha two is the only clinically licensed subtype. It's al already the point of care for um, hepatitis infections. And also, I think it's uh, recently um, uh, approved for hepatitis B also. But uh, so these were already tried for several other virus infections, but these were never successful. And it kind of gave a clue that maybe there's some kind of importance with the divergent evolution of the type 1 interferon family, especially the interferon alphas, because we have 13 different subtypes. And it kind of puts the spotlight on the subtype diversity and made us ask the question, is there any role for the other interferon alpha subtypes in terms of um, restricting virus infections? Could there be the case that one interferon alpha subtype is acting against one virus, while it's the other subtypes which are acting against other viruses, which is exactly why interferon alpha 2 is not successful against all viruses. So this is exactly why we want to get into the subtype diversity. And the point is, in the last few years, people have already asked this question, and they've already tried uh, looking into the other subtypes of interferon alphas, especially in mouse models, as well as in other animal models, because it's always about in vivo level of data as um, the point of evidence, if, especially if it has to go into the clinic. But interestingly, the um, interferon alpha subfamily in humans and mouse, or for that matter, any other animals are not completely homologous, which means, for example, interferon alpha 2 in humans is not completely homologous in terms of its sequence structure and function to the mouse interferon alpha 2. So if we use human interference subtypes on mouse models or any other animal models, of course, there's a species incompatibility, which will not help us to evaluate the efficacy and immunogenicity at systemic level. So what can we do about it? We cannot carry out a whole new study at human level without having um, a promising evidence at in vitro and in vivo level. We, of course, can do a lot of assays at in vitro level, but we, of course, need something at you know, something that's comparable to humans. And this is what made us uh, get into the 3D models that I was talking about earlier, because right now I'm also working with in vitro uh, cells of the different, um, res uh, the different respiratory cells, but we are also a group or the subgroup that's working with human lung tissue explants. So basically when uh, patients come into the clinic for getting their lung tumors removed, 
We also talk to them and then get a piece of their normal lungs, normal uninfected lungs that we would then use for infecting with different viruses and then trying out different therapeutics. So basically it's not really like steroids and organoids, organoids where we disintegrate the tissues and then resynthesize them in the lab, but it's actually retaining the primary tissue material and thereby uh, recapitulating what humans have in vivo and also the different patient heterogeneity as well as the cellular heterogeneity that comes along. So we thought this would be the perfect model or perfect alternative for a complete in vivo model because we're looking into the exact tissue specific responses. So uh, to put in a nutshell, I would, uh, I'm actually working on evaluating these human interferon alpha subtypes using um, uh, different respiratory cells as well as these primary human lung tissue explants that we get from the clinic. And the kind of questions that I want to answer are, what are the similarities and differences in the ISG programs that these different interferon alpha subtypes induce? Is it the case that few interferon alpha subtypes induce only this set of ISGs, while few other subtypes induce different other ISGs? And could the differential ISG repertoire be one of the reasons for the differential antiviral activities that we could hypothesize for? And also we wanted to ask the questions, especially in the, in the context of influenza, NXA has been the classical restriction factor that has been spoken of for years now. So we wanted to raise the question, could there be other restriction factors that could also be acting against uh, influenza viruses? And could these restriction uh, factors be the molecular determinants that could confer the differential antiviral activity to the different interferon alpha subtypes? So this is one aspect of my project. The other aspect of my project is to see if we can employ these interferon alpha subtypes in combination with the approved antiviral drugs, especially against flu in a combination setting to see if the diverse antiviral program regulated by these interferons in conjunction with the direct antiviral pressure imposed by these antiviral drugs can actually create a diverse restriction pressure within the cell, which would not let influenza viruses emerge as resistant strains. Because at least in the context of therapy for influenza viruses, it's not the case that we do not have therapeutics. We do have a lot of approved therapeutics. The problem there is that these viruses are so smart and very quickly evolving because of the infidelity of the polymerases that they somehow develop escape mutations and come out of the pressure imposed by these antivirals. So we wanted to ask the question if combining them with these interferons can diversify the pressure and not let the virus come out as resistant strains. So this is like an applied version or applied perspective of the project that I'm working on. And in terms of the techniques, I think technically my project is very interdisciplinary because I use techniques in virology, molecular biology, immunology, and I'm also the computer guy for the institute. So I do a lot of omics stuff. So I also do commands because I'm also coming from an engineering background. And I think that really helped me to answer the um, RNA seq and other um, big data that the institute is generating. So that's like a technical repertoire. And because it's a tissue level, we do single cell sequencing and immunohistopathology. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much the technical repertoire. Cool. And um, how far are you into your PhD? Um, so I'm a third year PhD student. Um, uh, yeah, so I have to hopefully complete by the end of this year. It depends on when I get my paper accepted. and. Uh, when my thesis gets revised. So I would hope to graduate by the end of this year or by, let's say, the first quarter of next year. Okay. And are you, do you have any ideas of where you're going next? What do you want to do next? Yeah. So I, as I already, uh, it, as it's already evident, I would definitely stick uh, with viruses and virology. And I really love what I'm doing now, uh, which is at the intersection of um, innate immunity and viruses. And I would also maybe at one point get more towards the systemic level and get into the systemic immunity and systemic immune uh, responses um, elicited in the context of viruses. So this would be my broad research interest. I'm still reading a lot of literature and then figuring out what my exact research niche is. Um, so it's definitely uh, at the intersection of viruses and immunity. And I already made up my mind that I would want to stay in academic research because given the case, I already tried industrial research. I already came to the realization that I'm not really cut out for industrial research or maybe not in a full-fledged manner. Uh, so I would definitely want to do a postdoc after this. And at one point of my academic career, I would want to uh, become a group leader or a PI that has his own research group and research questions and 
I would actually want to also replicate the vision that all of my previous mentors uh, demonstrated in terms of, you know, the knowledge transfer, because I have like a lot of learning. I would have a lot of learning in the further steps of my career. And I actually want to give that to the next generation and see them grow and like be uh, like a part of their vision. So I think this is something that I really love and especially coming from a family of teachers. And I think I really want to have a close relationship with teaching. So I, would want to become a professor at one point, but yeah. And then I guess just to finish, um, can you talk a little bit about how the last two years, the COVID pandemic has impacted you, um, sort of like professionally, but also personally? Yeah, uh, so professionally and personally, I would say I'm one of those people that had a predominantly positive impact because of COVID, because if you take professionally, my uh, PhD thesis was basically proposed in terms of um, uh, seasonal and highly pathogenic influenza viruses. But the onset of COVID just at the time when I started my PhD gave me a reason as to why I have to include COVID as a comparative virus system because there's a lot of common um, aspects between the two viruses. And also we felt that the question that we had with the interference can also be applied to COVID uh, or SARS-CoV-2. And so, uh, so definitely this means that uh, COVID-19 had led to the diversification of my broad research question for my PhD. Also, like every other institute and every other uh, lab that's now starting to work on, uh, that already started working on SARS-CoV-2, uh, I also had the opportunity to work on a lot of collaboration projects, meet a lot of different other groups that I wouldn't have imagined to uh, collaborate with if it wasn't for the pandemic and if it wasn't for the virus. So professionals, professionally speaking, I would say I really got benefited out of the pandemic and also um, personally speaking I think COVID-19 brought me to the realization that uh, the world is revolving around the concept of interdependence and not about independence because I th as, as, as someone that's outside of my home country it really is worrying to see uh, it was worrying to see the pandemic unfold and yeah so I think it really brought me as a person to uh, get to the realization that we are all dependent on each other um, in our real lives. And also at international level, there was a lot of exchange in terms of scientific reagents, in terms of knowledge and publications and reviews were never a deterrent factors for the exchange of knowledge. There was free sharing of reagents uh, and there was also sharing of vaccines. So all this together brought me to the realization that this world is working in the context of interdependence and never independence. So yeah, that's a personal lesson that I took. All right. Well, thanks so much. Uh, it was interesting to hear about your research and we look forward to hearing more about it uh, when you guys publish or maybe when you present uh, next year at ASV. Hopefully. It was also nice talking to you. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. This has been Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about people who study viruses. This is your host, Larissa Thackeray, and thanks for listening. You can find us on Google, Apple, Amazon Music, and other podcast providers, or at lmtv.podbean.com.